maybe there might be some some logic in there as trying to calm them down though there's probably some heated emotion as well but it is that is the drama of a emotional theater that has to happen between the between the fictional character of your worst self and your self to be basically uh, to go through all the arguments and say are are we done can i move forward now have you said everything that you needed to say to me great i'm moving forward What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Well, that's such an interesting point of wanting to fight the pain. And many in our audience will say they want to fight their inner critic. And they want to get in an argument with it and try to overpower it with logic in hopes to, to get it to quiet down. And we know from the science that that just doesn't really work. No, actually, I don't know if you have had Dick Schwartz on here, internal family systems therapy, but so in many ways we have, we can say we have different parts of ourselves. We should, I should probably call it selves compassion technically <laughs> because we have an inner critic. We've got a compassionate part. We have a wounded child part. We've got a mature wise part. We have all these different parts. And so what happens if you try to shut down the inner critic? Because remember, the inner critic is trying to keep you safe. The whole reason the inner critic is there is because, you know, it's maybe trying to protect you from your, the criticism of your father or trying to get you into shape so you don't make mistakes or trying to, you know, shame you so that you won't be so wounded by others. It doesn't work very well, but the, the motivation of the inner critic is always to keep you safe. And if you try to shut it down, it will just scream that much louder. But if you say, so we have a whole exercise in the, in the mindful self-compassion program we developed where we actually give compassion to the inner critic. We say, you know, I see you're trying to help me. Hasn't been working out very well, but you know, thank you so much for your efforts. I hear you. And then once you have kind of some understanding and appreciation for your inner critic, then it can say, okay, she hears me finally. All right. Well, okay. I can let this other voice in, which is the more compassionate voice. But what we resist persists and grows stronger. I mean, acceptance and commitment therapy, it's really all about that. I mean, there's a lot of self-compassion, especially implicitly in acceptance and commitment therapy. I think now they're starting to bring it in more explicitly. You guys probably more know about know more about that than me, but it's definitely totally imbued in the whole approach, at least implicitly. Well, certainly for all the interviews that we've done, I mean, the folks who always come off the most confident and the most successful all have a great working relationship with the worst aspects of themselves to the to, to the degree they'll even may even have a pet name for the worst aspects of themselves of that inner of that inner critic and they will have that dialogue they will see that dialogue through to its end and maybe there might be some some logic in there as trying to calm them down though there's probably some heated emotion as well but it is that is the drama of a emotional theater that has to happen between the between the fictional character of your worst self and your self to be basically uh, to go through all the arguments and say are are we done can i move forward now have you said everything that you needed to say to me? Great. I'm moving forward. Well, sometimes we need to be draw a fierce boundary with their inner critic, right? So sometimes we need to use fierce compassion also inward, not only protecting ourselves from others, but sometimes from those parts of ourselves. Maybe just draw a boundary and say, that's enough. I'm not going to listen to this right now. But then we also want the tender self-compassion when we're able to, that kind of more accepting side, that warm side. That's really the healing power of self-compassion is that accepting, nurturing energy. But there is also a place for drawing some pretty fierce boundaries. I call that mama bear self-compassion. There's mama and mama bear. And both are really important aspects of being a caring person. Well, it's interesting that you bring up boundaries. Uh, and with our clients, those who seem to be their worst critics. Also, for whatever reason, it's always correlated that they have 
they don't have boundaries drawn up from friends and family who are taking advantage of them. So then they get put in this cycle. Then they realize I've, I've got to take advantage again. So now the inner critic comes out to beat them up. And of course, they're always going to rationalize it with I'm being kind. I have infinite amount of time and, and opportunities to help everybody. But without setting up those boundaries, you're giving your, so much of yourself out and you're not focusing on the things that matter so that you are able to help people at your best. We drop great content each and every week and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Yeah, exactly. And also the reason for help. So, so a lot of the reasons people don't say no, the re, you know, some people say yes because they really authentically want to help. That's great. That's wonderful. It's admirable. But often we say yes because we don't want other people to dislike us. And when we're doing it because we're afraid of the judgments of others or we want other people to like us or we want them to think we're a nice person, it's actually not authentic. And that's that's where you get that correlation because we're, we don't feel confident enough in ourselves. We don't like ourselves enough to risk, you know, maybe they won't like me as much if I say no. Well, that's okay, I like myself. You know, this is important to me. I'm gonna do what's authentic for me. And to be able to do that, to draw boundaries, there needs to be some sense of self-worth that comes from the inside as opposed to just the approval of others. Which is one another thing self-compassion gives us, non-contingent self-worth. Less need for social approval is one of the big important benefits of it. Yeah, I'd like to unpack that a little bit more because I feel like social approval is really a big driving force for many people listening to the show and that, that want and need to be accepted in the community. No one wants to be in the out group, so we find ourselves bowing to others' expectations of us, going outside of our own needs and wants to please them, becoming people pleasers, etc. So how does this all come together? One way I've talked about this distinction is really the distinction between self-esteem and self-compassion. So self-esteem is an evaluation of self-worth. Self-compassion is giving yourself like unconditional kindness and support, whether or not you're worthy, you know, it's just kind of like whether you failed or you succeeded. It's just, you know, being kind to yourself regardless. So self-esteem, there's, there's healthy self-esteem. There can be even unconditional self-esteem, but usually self-esteem is contingent. It's contingent on th the three main areas actually they find in the research are social approval, perceived attractiveness and success, whether that's business or sports, whatever is important to you. And um, that contingency is a problem because again, if people don't approve of us or if we don't succeed or if we don't look the way we wanna look, we feel badly about ourselves, we hate ourselves and we start self-criticizing. And it's, it really is this downward spiral. So one of the things we know from the research is that self-compassion reduces the contingency of self-worth. Right? Again, because you're, you're, whether you succeed or fail, you're still worthy. Whether you're looking like you want to or not, you're still worthy. You know, Whether other people like you or not, you're still worthy. Because again, your worth is, it comes from this, just from being a human being who suffers. Like that's all you got to do to have self-compassion, to be a human being who suffers. And that's a box that can always be checked. <laughs> and so because you have this more unconditional, stable source of self-worth, your self-esteem doesn't need to be so contingent on these outside sources. I think that's a big piece of why it's so difficult for somebody who hasn't set up boundaries in the past to then all of a sudden know that they have to put these boundaries up and they're going to be terrified of how it's going to be taken because those people have always had that access. And so now they're being told no for the first time. And that can be a shock because that reaction that person has now changed. They're not the same person. They're not as open as they used to be to these requests. And that's why self-compassion is so important. Every step of the way. So self-compassion helps you draw the boundary because you care about yourself. Self-compassion also helps you deal with the fear of drawing the boundary. Oh, well, I'm really afraid this is hard. And if you do get a bad reaction, and let's face it, you might, you know, how do you hold the pain with it? How do you relate to yourself? when your mother's mad at you because you didn't do what she want, you know, you, you have to be able to relate to that pain. 
So self-compassion is really needed every step of the way. And also sometimes, you know, someone may make a choice. Well, actually, I'd, I really don't want to say yes, but in this situation, maybe it's your boss. Or, you know, maybe sometimes you don't have the choice you, you would like to have. Sometimes people, it's kind of a, some people aren't able to draw the boundaries that they'd like to because they aren't as privileged. You know, maybe you're discriminated against or you're in a tenuous situation or a lot of external factors come into play. So we also don't want people to think that if I don't, if I don't draw a boundary, I'm a wimp, you know, that's, that's not good either. We just want to like do the best we can given our circumstances with as much kindness and support and care as we possibly can. And no one on the outside can tell you what's right for you.